Somebody turn the heat on in here. Man, I'm sweaty already. And you got me for another 25 or 30 minutes. So give me a second. Jim's nice enough to bring me my water. So <clears throat> hope you guys have had a good week. We are continuing our um, series class and session. Uh, it's a teaching, teachings of Jesus. And we're going to continue that this morning in Luke 10. But before I get into that, um, eight years ago, which is hard to believe for me because I remember this event like it was the other day, um, there's a, a guy by the name of Charles Ramsey who um, woke up on the morning of May 6, 2013, and his life would forever change. Um, waking up and leaving the house and getting his McDonald's in the morning was something that he did routinely. And, um, but this morning <coughs> on May 6th was going to be slightly different. Um, on his way home from getting his McDonald's, he, um, he notices that there's a, a woman banging at his next door neighbor's house on the door trying to get out and to get free. And he notices it and he goes up and he ends up breaking the bottom of the store to allow this woman to be free. <clears throat> and when she gets out of this door, uh, she immediately asks him to, to do dial 911. And, and they dial 911. And on the phone, she is trying to explain that her name is Amanda Berry and she's been missing for over 10 years. And that, for the, and that there's two other women in the house who have been gone for just about the same amount of time. This event happened um, in Cleveland. And Charles here... Um, ends up having this interview that you're pictured here, and he explains the story way differently than I did. Um, it actually <clears throat> becomes somewhat of national news, and he b begins having all these different interviews and, and things, and, and people start calling him a hero um, for rescuing these three women who have been captive for such a long time. Most of us, um, when we look at this opportunity that he had, uh, we don't always get chances or opportunities like this to have such a huge effect on somebody's life. But I fully believe that we have opportunities around us to change the world and to change lives around us. Most of us would consider that <clears throat> um, Charles there was acting just as a good Samaritan of helping somebody uh, who, who was in need. And so <clears throat> what we're talking about with Jesus' teaching is, of course, the good Samaritan. But in our day, the good Samaritan... Um, has somewhat become different than how Jesus intended it to be in this story. If you looked it up in the dictionary, the word Samaritan has a few different definitions. And you would think that the most likely definition for this would be a group of people from Samaria, because that's really what a Samaritan was. Um, but actually, the first definition that comes up is a charitable or helpful person. And basically, how we've used this name is pretty much just doing something unnecessar unnecessarily nice for a stranger. So now, obviously, we have people who are, uh, do incredibly heroic things for, for strangers all the time. Um, last week, I don't know if you did this or not, but I took uh, a f some moments of watching the documentary on 9-11 called One Day in America. And it was very interesting throughout um, just the many stories that were told of um, people that they had never met um, helping each other to escape these buildings or, or to do something that was heroic for somebody that they had never met before. And some of these people got to meet um, the people who helped them out and um, others didn't. But um, from these stories, of course, we see amazing things that you would call kindness towards strangers and maybe even say, um, that they were a good Samaritan or acting as a good Samaritan. But there's an also a side of our culture that we see as something of a small thing of kindness that we're also like, man, um, yeah, he helped carry his groceries to the car. What a, what a good Samaritan. What a, what a kind gesture and something. And really, that's not what Jesus is intending through Luke 10. Um, a story for me was uh, a few years back, I went to a Christian leadership conference um, in this big arena. It was in Atlanta, and um, I ended up 
during the session. I don't know, still don't know how, but I lost my wallet. And if you ask my wife, this is something common um, of losing my, wa- my, my wallet and my keys and my phone and um, all those things. But um, <clears throat> anyway, I lose my wallet. Um, and we, we took a break for lunch. And of course, I realized I lost my wallet when I go to pay for lunch. And I'm like, I don't have my wallet. Um, a friend, you know, helps me out and they you know, spot me for a second. But then I start to think, well, where did I lose it? And so when we get back to the arena, I uh, end up going to the seats that we were sitting in to look all around to see if it's laying there. It's nowhere in sight. And so in that moment, I begin to start freaking out and like, okay, shoot, where's my wallet? And for me, it's not like I freak out because I might lose money. That's that's okay. For me, it's like, man, I gotta lock my bank account. I got I gotta go to the BMV again to get new license. You know, all the hassle of that stuff um, is really what's the irritating thing. But anyway, at the end of the session, the MC at the end is like, hey, there's a Heath Clark in in the in the uh, arena. Your wallet's been found. It's at such and such a desk. You need to go pick it up. And You know, I'm very thankful for that person who went and did such an act of kindness for me as a stranger to return my wallet. But once again, it's not just the nice things that we do out of the kindness of our heart that Jesus is trying to intend when it comes to being a good Samaritan. In fact, the original purpose of this story wasn't to inspire this man. It was to enlighten him, to make him look in the mirror to say, wow, I'm not such of a good Samaritan after all. And so we're going to go into Luke chapter 10, <clears throat> starting uh, verse 25 through 37. You can, we're going to be in there for most of uh, the message today. But it begins by a teacher of the law, which you could consider a lawyer, but this isn't like a defense attorney lawyer in a courtroom. Um, this is actually more of like a seminary teacher who, ha- who, who he's a, a religious figure, and he's an expert at knowing the Mosaic law. And a lot of thing, and he also knows a lot of things in the Old Testament that we read today. Um, he knew them very well. He uh, dedicated his life to this. Um, he knew what it meant to finding answers of how to achieve, to how to achieve wholeness um, before God. What what does it look to be a servant of God? Um, he he knew how, what it looked like to try to figure out how to get to heaven. He he had all these answers um, during his everyday life. But as Scripture tells us. It says that he probably went that day, and we know that he went to test Jesus. Um, Some of the translations actually say that he intended to trap Jesus. And um, and the reason for that is because throughout Jesus' ministry, this teacher of the law and his buddies had heard Jesus' kind of new teaching that it goes against their Mosaic law of, you know, like, there's a prostitute, there's a tax collector, and their lives don't, don't line up with all the laws that, that I've been reading about. They're sinful. Um, but, you know, Jesus is talking about, hey, if you, if you believe and follow me, um, you know, you're going to ha- inherit eternal life. And so as they listened to this and knew what Jesus was teaching on um, and, and his forgiveness, they weren't really a big fan of his message. And in fact, it was frustrating to them. These group of men um, hadn't realized that the gospel message, the one that Jesus was teaching about, uh, it didn't make them the hero. Um, The attention was no longer on them of knowing the laws and keeping them, and now the hero was actually Jesus, who was right in front of him, the Son of God. And so like I said, uh, they didn't like this, and this man is approaching Jesus saying, you know what, I'm going to show Jesus a thing or two about what I know about the law and what he doesn't. And um, if you know anything about In scripture, when you read that somebody is trying to test Jesus, you know that's not good. You know something is going. Somebody's going to get embarrassed. Um, Somebody has no idea what they're what they're in for. But this isn't going to end end well. We know this. And so he asked Jesus, and he's like, "Hey, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life?" And you know, in his mind, he's thinking Jesus is going to answer this question similar to what he's been preaching. That grace message, that message of, you know, I'm going to forgive you. That's all you have to do. Not everything that they knew. Um, that all you have to do is believe in me. But, you know, Jesus didn't say that. Um, 
And, and you can imagine that he was about to, if he answered that way, pounce on Jesus like the trap was set. He was going to start rattling off the Ten Commandments, um, all these laws, all these things that he's read. He, he was going to rattle off and say that Jesus was um, being blasphemous and claiming to be the Son of God. You know, there's a lot of things that he's planning on Jesus to answer. And he, he asked this question of what must you do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus simply responds, and he says, I don't know. What's the law say? Like, you're the teacher of the law. You know the law. I know that you know everything about the Old Testament. I know that you have studied this. You've dedicated your life to this. What's the law say? And so he's like, you tell me, is basically what he's saying. And he's probably caught off guard in this moment because he wasn't expecting that from Jesus. And so he kind of comes up with an answer, and he thinks of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he's like, well, you got to love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, mind, strength, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, and Jesus is like, yeah, that's right, you do that. If you do that, you know, if you, if you can say that you can love God with all of your heart, and if you can say selflessly that you can love your neighbor more than you love yourself, then yeah, you're going to be justified before God and inherit the, inherit the kingdom of heaven. But of course, you have not done that. And of course, you are not capable of doing that. And so I think he realizes that from Jesus. And then he starts to get technical and he wants a definition and defining things. And so he asks a follow-up question. He's like, okay, to love my neighbor, who, who really is my neighbor? Like, is my neighbor everybody? Is my neighbor just the house on the left and the right, maybe across the road? Is, is my neighbor my community, just the city that I live in? Like, who really is my neighbor? And so he asked this question to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus famously responds with this story that we're about to dive into to show this teacher of the law that he is not as good of a Samaritan as he thinks he is. So Jesus begins to let this man find himself in this story. And he begins to say that, starting in verse 30, a man, and we can assume that he's probably a Jewish man, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Um, for a second, as I studied this more uh, on the road to Jerusalem and Jericho, um, I found out a few things about this road. <clears throat> um, the first thing is that this road was known for trade and travel and business, and that the terrain of it was not friendly. It was um, known to be a dangerous road for that reason alone. It was a skinny path. But the second reason of this road um, between there was that it was known for notoriously being dangerous for robbers and bandits, that it was easily... Um, it was able for them to easily come in to rob somebody and escape throughout all these passages, tunnels to, to get out into the desert and be free. And so, so everybody sitting there listening to Jesus knows this. They know about this road. They know how dangerous it is. And as Jesus is telling this story, they're probably thinking, you know, I hope this Jewish man wasn't traveling alone. I hope this Jewish man was uh, not traveling at night. I hope it was during the daytime. Um, but either way, they knew that this was a dangerous road. And so the next part of this story that happens with the robbers is that not only did they rob him, but they stripped him naked, beat him down, and left him for dead, lying on the road. And so we are about to see three different people come along. <clears throat> and in this story, we are actually hoping that the first person that comes along is the answer. And to be honest, it is the most likely answer when we read scripture. A priest comes, and we're thinking, you know, this guy will surely help. Um, this guy should be a man of God. Uh, he, he's known to have the most compassion um, for other people. Um, and so instead of helping this man, this priest sees the man lying there, left for dead, and Scripture tells us that he crossed the road and kept on going. And mind you, this is a very skinny road, so you can imagine he probably almost steps over the man to, to keep going, and, and he sees what has happened. The next guy that comes along is a Levite. And if, if you know about Levites, Levites were actually pretty much second, second tier down from priests, like second in command, you could say, um, in the temple. So they too, you would expect them to show compassion on others. 
for our sake and our purpose for this example, we're just going to say that Jared was the priest, okay? He's the number one guy. And then the youth minister comes along, okay? This is the Levite who does the exact same thing. He sees, he sees him, and he ends up hopping over, crossing the road, and moving on. And so based on both their nationality and their profession, we would expect them to, this man that was lying on the road, would expect these two men um, to help him out. But you can imagine that when they didn't, he might have lost hope and may have lost wanting to even see another day or thinking that he will see another day. And scripture doesn't really tell us reasons that these two men kept on going, but we can kind of imagine maybe um, a few reasons. And I'm sure they had a million reasons, right? Like we all have reasons to not, to help somebody. But um, I can imagine that if they see this man lying there, um, maybe it's after a long day of already helping people that they're like, you know what, I just want to get back to my family. It's getting dark. Um, you know, I've, I've done some good deeds all day. This is one last one that I really just, I'll let the next person come. Or maybe they see the man and, and they know the, the danger of the road and they, and they think, um, you know, the robbers may still be in this area. What's happened to this man could very well happen to me and I really don't feel like dying today. So I'm just going to keep going. But then Jesus continues, and this is our third guy. Um, he says that then a Samaritan came by. And this is important to know that Jews absolutely hated Samaritans. And Samaritans absolutely hated Jews. And so for a long time, this has been going on, this rival, rivalry between each other. But we know that actually way back in the day, they were part of the same family. They basically split directions based on their worship beliefs. The Jews thought that they should worship this way towards God. The Samaritans thought they should worship this way towards God. But ultimately, they worshiped the same God but we're still at um, tension with each other. They just didn't like each other. And uh, so when they're listening, seeing on the story, and Jesus says, then a Samaritan came by, they're probably like, oh my goodness, a Samaritan came by? Like, what's this guy doing on this road? Like, please tell me that you're not going to say that he's helping him. And really in scripture, we see that not only did every Jewish person not understand this, but even Jesus' disciples didn't understand why Jesus would go into Samaria and talk to, to minister to them. They never really grasped why, you know, in John chapter 4 of Jesus being at the woman at the well, and we see his compassion for this woman, a Samaritan woman. They didn't really ever grasp it. In fact, there's a really short story, a chapter before this in Luke chapter 9, if you want to turn there with me. Luke 9, verse 51. We see, in my mind, this is a little bit of a funny story, but also like a story where you can see how much they don't get why Jesus is, is ministering to Samaria. <clears throat> but Luke 51 through 56, there's a short story of Jesus is about to return to Jerusalem, and he needs a place to stay along the way. It's too, too far of a travel to get there. And he sends his disciples ahead of him to go and look in the Samaritan village for a place for him to be put up for the night, to, to be housed, to be fed, to, um, you know, just stay there. And what happens is um, the Samaritan people of the village were like, no, there's no way that this guy is staying here. Um, I don't care if he's Jesus. You know, they didn't know who Jesus was. But whatever Jewish guy is coming through, he's not staying here because we don't like, we don't like Jews. We don't like Samaritans, that tension. And so James and John, who we know to be two of Jesus' closest disciples, in scripture, it says that they came back and told Jesus what had happened, and this is their idea. They're like, you know what, Jesus? They didn't let you in. We should call down fire from heaven and kill them. Like, that seems like a good plan, right? Like, they didn't let you stay in their village, so now we just have to kill them. Like, you know, like, the idea for them isn't first like, hey, Jesus, they didn't let you into their town. We need to find somewhere else to stay. No, it was just like, let's just take them over. Let's just, like, take over their village. And, um, and so he comes back, and, of course, Jesus, when they say this, is like, um, no. All right? He rebuked them, is what Scripture said. But you can see that, you know, even the disciples didn't understand, like, the 
a need for Jesus to go into Samaria to, you know, start to begin his church of building his church from every tribe, tongue, and nation. They didn't understand that. And so this Samaritan, going back to the story, we want to observe three things about this Samaritan because these three things that we notice about him as Christians today, I believe will allow us to change the world and change our community. So here's the three things that we can notice about this Samaritan. The first thing is he took notice. <clears throat> the second thing is that he took pity. And then the third thing is he took action. So the first thing that Luke 10.33 says about the Samaritans is that he saw the man. We need to be able to observe and notice things around us. We have to be able to open our eyes to other people's problems around us. And after we are able to see the problem, we can't be like the first two guys, that, that lead minister and youth guy, um, to, you know, just keep on going and leave. We need to be able to see the problem, take pity, as Scripture tells us, um, like the Samaritan man did. You can imagine that if you're in the shoes of this Samaritan man as he's approaching this Jewish man who's lying on the road, that there would be some temptations of saying, you know what, this guy wouldn't have helped me if I was in his shoes because... I know that he hates me, you know, like, why would I help him out? I'm sure there's temptations of, of that, of saying, you know, like, I can just keep going, like, I don't care if another Jewish guy passes away, you know, like, there would be temptations for him to say, I'm not helping this man. But instead, the Samaritan decides to feel and see past his nationality. He decides to see past the hate that his group has caused, and he begins to simply looking at this person as a, as a human being saying that this man has worth, this man probably has a family, this man was created in the image of God, and simply asking the question, what if it were me? And that's the key point out of all of what Jesus is trying to explain to this man, that it is empathizing for others around you. It's putting your feet in other people's shoes. And so when he took notice and was willing to take pity, he was on his way to becoming more like Jesus. And what do we know about Jesus' personality? Jesus is described most in Scripture as being a, a, a very compassionate man. Um, and this is not just the compassion of, you know, I, I'm so sorry your cat died. Um, you know, I, I, I hope you can get over that. No, it's, it's the compassion of you hear that somebody lost a loved one, maybe even at a young age, and, and you just get those knots in your stomach of being like, man, I can't believe this is actually happening to somebody. That kind of compassion towards somebody. This is what Jesus had um, on, on, on his friends, on his disciples, but you even see this on, on his best friend Lazarus when he hears of Lazarus' death, and he, he goes from miles away to be with Mary and Martha, and he grieves with them. Like, this is the compassion that Jesus has for them, but he also has for you and for me. <clears throat> but once again, this Samaritan had compassion for this man laying there for dead. Um, the second, or the third thing that he does, he not only takes pity and notices, but this is the important and crucial part that sometimes we miss, and that's that he took action. And so what's the action that he did? He got up, he got off his donkey, he came down to the man who was lying there for dead, and, and he gets out oil and, and wine that we can imagine is used medically, um, maybe as like a peroxide for infections and things like that, and he begins to take care of this man's wounds. And so he wraps him, and he bandages him, and, and it says that he puts him up on his donkey. And he takes the man and walks him miles, possibly out of the way from where he was going, um, to, to put this man up in an inn for somebody to hopefully take care of him so that he can get rested and get better and be on his way. But not only does he just take him to the inn, but he pays the wage. He pays for the food that he's going to need there ahead of it. And for whatever else that the man needed, he said, hey, just let me know. I'll pay for it as well. And so he assists financially. But even in this, we know that he has his own responsibilities. It says in scripture that the next day he left in the morning. And like I said at the beginning of this with this road is because it's, it's a road of trade for business. And so he might have had to maybe go back to his family, or maybe he had other responsibilities within his own job of he had to go and be somewhere. Um, but I think this is a really important thing to notice because <clears throat> when he found him there on the side of the road, this man's life was more important than his own responsibilities, his time, 
Um, it was more important than maybe even his job or his family right in that moment because he saw a need. And I think that sometimes within our busy lives, we can get, give all the responsibility excuses in the world because if we're honest, sometimes in our busy schedules, we don't even allow ourselves to have opportunities like this. We can't even do the first step well of noticing somebody who's in need. Um, but the Samaritan man knew what it meant to not be so self-consumed in his busyness and the issues that might, he might have been dealing with to love others more than we love ourselves. And so not only did this man sacrifice his money, his finances, but he sacrificed his time. So I promise you that when you take notice, when you can take pity and take legitimate action for somebody else's lives, that we would see change in this world. But unfortunately for the story, that's not the point. That's not the point that Jesus is trying to get across to this, to this man. You see, this sermon isn't about, you know, hey, I'm going to leave here. Let's go be good Samaritans together. Let's go be kind to strangers. Let's go, um, you know, I haven't been back to church for a while. I'm going to start coming every Sunday. Um, you know, I hear the children's area needs volunteers, needs, needs servants. You know, I'm going to start volunteering doing that. No, this message is to realize that we're not good Samaritans. This story is to help a man look in the mirror and realize I'm not a good Samaritan and neither are we. And that's the point. This is not a motivation, okay, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to, I'm going to tithe weekly. No, it's not about that. This man was being told that the only way that he was going to go to heaven by his own admission was to be so good and perfect, to love God so well, and to love your neighbor so selflessly that you love him more than you love yourself. That's what he could try to do, but he was going to fail. And so who is your neighbor? It's every person who's ever hated you. We don't love people who love us as well as this man loved the man who hated him. I'm going to read that again. We don't love people who love us as well as this man loved the man who hated him. The point of this story is so that this man, the teacher of the law, would come to realize that it's impossible to love like this. Then who else would be saved? None of us. None of us would be saved. But he was hopefully going towards a place of Romans 3.20, where it says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And so it's for him to realize that for himself, the answer that he thought Jesus would give originally at the start of all this, of Jesus coming to save, that all you have to believe, do is believe and, and you'll be forgiven. You know, he was hopefully coming to that point and, and not to the point within his law of, you know, I got to do this, I got to do this and to be never good enough, but that God would come with mercy and pity and love and love the ones that don't deserve it and to put himself in the place for us so that we would inherit eternal life. And so you, me, everyone here, this isn't for us to be a good Samaritan because Jesus is our good Samaritan. Jesus was the one who came and saw someone dying in need. Jesus is the one who has compassion on us and takes pity on us. Jesus is the one who came down from his throne and put himself in our place and switched us places. He's the one who came to heal the brokenness, heal our wounds and hurts, and to come and take care of us. That is Jesus. And so Jesus' message for a religious man who knew a lot more scripture for him to come to realize that he needed Jesus. He didn't need more knowledge. He didn't need more rituals. He didn't need more things to do. He needed to surrender his life from his religion to find out all the things that he was going to be doing were in vain and to realize that he was in need of a savior. And my question for you is, is, are you that person this morning? Maybe you've been coming to this church for quite a long time, but you've always just been doing it for just checking off the boxes of saying, you know, I, I come to church every Sunday. Um, you know, I, I tithe every week. Um, I'm a nice person. I'm kind. Um, you know, I'm, but you haven't actually surrendered your life and said, you know what, God, I'm, I'm here, left, beaten for dead in this road, and I'm in need of you to come and save me. Um, maybe you're somebody who you've come from a broken past, and you're not proud of your past. Um, it's ugly. It's disgusting. You, you'd never want to even talk about it. Maybe you're still that same person who's, who's just left there for dead, just waiting for somebody to come by and help you. 
I want to be here this morning and tell you that there's a God who loves you so much that has given himself up for you for an opportunity for you to have eternal life. And that's what it means to not be a good Samaritan. So won't you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you and <clears throat> we know that <clears throat> nothing that we can do here on this earth is ever going to be good enough to be part of your kingdom. Nothing of our good deeds or anything that <clears throat> we can do, even in your name, that we are in such a need of your grace and love of a Savior to come and rescue us, that <clears throat> help us to not continue with our religion, with our rituals of just checking off boxes, Father. Just help us to, to surrender to you and, and let you work within our lives to do what you have for us. Help us to seek your will, to seek your guidance, to, tr to love others selflessly, but to do it in your name, to see others come to know you in your kingdom, Father. You're the one who makes the change. You're the one who, who gives life, eternal life for others. We love you so much, and it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. It's time for us to do what we do each week of a decision song. So um, if you want to make that decision this morning, there will be an elder up here to uh, talk with you. But won't you all stand, and we're going to sing our song together.